Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti-financial advisor. Hey, I want to welcome you to show this for you and about you. Those who work so hard for your money and you want your money to start working harder for you right now. You want that freedom, cash flow, prosperity today, not 30 or 40 years from now, but right now to live that life that you love with those that you love. But most importantly, it's not just about getting rich. It's about living a rich life because as you become more prosperous financially, you can bless the lives of others. And that is exactly the ripple effect I'm here to create with you guys today. I appreciate you so much for tuning in. Appreciate you binging and you've been sharing in these episodes and, and sharing it with others. And, and that is exactly the ripple effect that I'm here to create. So thank you so much for allowing me to do so. As a reminder, guys, be sure to go to our website, moneyripples.com. There's great new playlists you can check out new content new information whether you're looking at infinite banking you know the max roi infinite banking or you're looking at things such as how do you create more passive income go check out those things right now chris miles was able to retire twice by the time he was 39 years old but he's not content to just enjoy his own financial freedom and peace of mind chris wants you to have your own ripple effect so you can live free today He's not the financial advisor you expected. He's the anti-financial advisor you deserve. He's jumping behind the mic right now, ready to make waves. Here's Chris Miles. All right, today, guys, I want to talk about something that was kind of a mind-blowing factor for me, right? Uh, it just happened over this last weekend. I was, I was speaking with, you know, I was actually at a conference with a bunch of dentists. Uh, There's a friend there, Alistair McDonald, that was speaking. A uh, guy actually I've been looking to get on this podcast here as a guest here soon. Um, but you know, brilliant guy comes from Zimbabwe. He's seen a lot of different things. He's seen hyperinflation, like real hyperinflation, not like what we see today, way worse. Uh, he's seen these kind of things in action, right? And so he was talking about the different things with the markets. Now understand with my background, right? I started as a traditional mainstream financial advisor, and that doesn't make you an expert by any means. It just makes you a good salesman in a suit, right? Um, that's good if you actually make money. Um, but I actually went into stock coaching, right? I actually started doing stock investing, trading stocks and options and taught others how to do the same thing. And um, after teaching hundred, several hundred people, I, the one of my most favorite topics to teach was intermarket analysis, right? How do all these different markets affect each other? How's the dollar rising or falling in value ultimately affect stocks, you know, the stock market, right? Going up or down, you know, how does that affect bonds? You know, how does that affect interest rates and everything else, you know? And so, for example, the stronger the dollar got, usually we teach that interest rates would come down, right? And as interest rates come down, that drives the stock market up because there's more profit in those companies. So to be that, that inverse kind of relationship, almost like that, you know, you know, rise up, push down, push up the market, right? You know, rise up at the dollar value, push down rates, drive up the market. And vice versa, if the dollar falls in value, they start to, you know, rise interest rates and then, you know, revert, it actually does that. Now the opposite effect bring, brings down the market. So there'd be this cause and effect in the market, right? Like dollars rise. As the dollar rises, they want to rise interest rates. And as a result, eventually that pushes down the stock market because that takes out profitability of the companies. The inverse was also true is the dollar falls is try to lower interest rates, which would eventually push up the markets, right? So we would look for those kind of things. We would want lower interest rates. We'd always talk about that. Uh, but when Alistair was presenting on this, he talked about, you know, a lot of the talk about the feds, right? Many of us think that the feds are the ones that can be driving these rates higher. Now, there's been talk about raising rates anywhere from at least three quarters of a percent, three times to maybe seven times over the next year or so, Right. And, and that's freaking people out, supposedly. But here's what's interesting, is that I thought that, of course, as they start to announce those things, it drives those rates up, then it eventually drives things down. But the truth is, the Fed, you should stop listening to them. Because <laughs> the truth is, the Feds are wrong almost all the time. I mean, you go back to even 2007, right before everything tanked, they were saying the market was strong, things were great, real estate was fine, and then what happened? See, they're going to say whatever they try to say, try to keep the markets from reacting too negatively, right? Until it's too late. But the truth is, is that the feds don't actually, or aren't not the cause. The feds news and the feds decisions do not create the, the effects of the marketplace. In fact, all the feds are doing is reacting to what's already happening in the marketplace. They're only reacting. 
So when people keep saying like, well, we got to look at these Fed notes and they and they start analyzing it. And then they suppose the markets go either go up or down based on what's said in those Fed meetings as they're picking out you know, word by word, line by line, sentence by sentence. And what do they mean by this and that? They're picking apart all the Fed's talk. But the truth is the Fed's kind of lie, right? I mean, they were telling us it was transitory inflation when most of us with common sense knew this was not transitory. So e either we're a lot smarter than the Fed's or the feds flat out lie and just say whatever they need to say to try to keep politicians happy while also trying to keep the markets happy and keep everything in this balance. It's like an airplane that's slowly crashing, but Hey, you know what? If we just keep pushing that fuel and just trying to let it glide as long as we can before it crashes, everything will be fine. Right? That's kind of what they do. They're really just, you know, even though they're bankers, they're really just an extension of politicians in many ways. Now, Here's the thing that's interesting. You look at what's going on, right? You actually look at what's going on with the feds. Again, they don't create the, the markets. They don't drive up interest rates. In fact, they just follow interest rates. This was the big mind blower for me, right? Again, this is a guy that I've been, I've been studying this stuff for years. And just this slight thing makes all the difference. So I'm going to show you a few charts here showing the treasury yields, right? Now, I've, I've fallen the 10-year treasury yield, but I hadn't made this correlation yet. Um, there's the two-year treasury yield to show you right here, right now. So let me go ahead and share my screen. You see this. This is showing the historicals of it, right? So the green line you're seeing here is the, two, the two-year treasury note yield. Now, treasuries, you know, this is the, these are the rates that actually do respond day in and day out. The feds don't respond day in and day out. They respond usually based on their meetings unless they call an emergency meeting to do something. But notice that the black line, which are the feds, tend to follow. Now, this is starting from 1995. This is not going back to the 80s. I'll show you that one in a second, which is really interesting. Uh, but notice that as the rates are coming down, right, they come down on the, on the treasury notes, and then the Fed starts to bring them down. Now, notice this. Like here, the rates, you know, the rates are climbing again on the treasury note. This is back just before Y2K, right, in the late 90s. Notice that the, you know, as it started to come down there all the way into 2000, the feds didn't respond until 2000. So even though it had been going down for several months, the feds finally responded. There was this lag effect of when they actually responded. You know, same thing as they come crashing down. Now, eventually, you see the rates going back up. Right there about, uh, just right in the beginning of 2003, they start coming back up, which is about the time the stock market was coming up too. So you start to see the treasury note come up, and then finally the feds follow suit months later. Same thing, starts to go down there in 2007, remember that? Starts to go down, the feds then finally started to lower it after it was already going down. It already flatlined, but then it was going down. They responded months later, and this is after there was a big bubble burst. Then of course they bottom out. Now again, rates were coming back up, you know, right about time, right before Trump became president, they started climbing back up, and the feds rate went up. And then there's the COVID crash, bam. Now notice the rates were already coming down before this crash. So some people were even making the prediction saying, hey, the feds are gonna lower the rates. And they're like, why, why would they do that? This is pre-COVID, right? Because look, the height of the, ten -year, the two year treasury note was actually at the end there of 2000, really not even the end of 2019, um, really towards the end of 2018, they started coming down. The feds didn't do anything. They didn't do anything until later. And of course they crashed and then they called an emergency meeting and brought the rates down, but they were already coming down. They were slow to respond. They were already coming down pre-COVID, right? There was already signs they were seeing that they were having to lower the rate again. But again, they, they did it late. They always waited longer. So understand, they're just watching these yields. So if you really want to see what's going on, watch it. You know, Watch what's happening with these two-year treasury note yields or the 10-year even. The 10-year is very, very similar. Um, we've actually seen the 10-year go up over the last several months while they've kept the rates down. So of course, it's going to be no shock that they're going to raise rates. It won't take a rock science to predict that because the, the, the treasuries have gone up. In fact, you can see that right here at the end of this chart, treasuries are going up. They've still kept it flatlined. They'll follow late. So they're just responding much later, in many cases, later than they should. Um, that, and the reason I say later than they should, because here, Paul Volcker, right? Now, if you guys know who Paul Volcker was, he was the Fed president during Ronald Reagan's era. Now, you always hear about the interest rates back then and being like 18, 20 percent, you know, Fed funds rate and things like that. Super high, super high, you know, federal funds rate, right? That, that prime rate was going up sky high. Now, 
what people don't realize is that when the treasuries changed, Paul was just faster. Check this out. So here, this is a zoomed in. You can see from the late 70s into the almost the mid 80s there. Now, you can see here, um, we got the dotted line, which is the federal funds rate, right? Especially as Paul Volcker came in the 80s. Um, you can see there, the treasury bill rate is that dotted line. So again, the treasury bill rates are going up. You see that the Fed rate is going up with it. Now, what's interesting is that March of 1980, it hit a peak. April 1980, you know, and that's when it started coming down, right? April 1980, Paul Volcker responds. December 1980, it peaks, starts to go down. Same thing, January of 81, the next month, he responds. So rather than going months and months before you make a response, he was responding pretty much within a month or two, right? He was responding quickly to what those rates were doing. The question is, is it really just because he raised rates and that's what helped curb the inflation that they had? Or was it that he just responded so quickly? So that's the kind of thing I want you guys to consider is that when everybody's talking about the feds, the feds, the feds, and I've been guilty of this too. The truth is, is that the feds don't really matter. <laughs> They're just reacting to something that's already happened. They're a lag effect. You want to see what's really going on for the future. Start looking at these treasury notes, which you can look up online. You can actually go and Google looking at different places, you know, uh, you know, even just different uh, big news sites or even financial sites. You can find these kind of things. But my point is this, is that don't get thrown off by what the feds say and all that news. Don't worry about it. Now, um, going, you know, after Ellis, Ellis started gave his presentation, right? Um, I took him off the stage afterwards and I said, hey, so here's the real question is, okay, we're starting to see that the feds are the result. They're reacting to these rates. What's driving the rates? What's the cause of that? What's leading that to that point? And as we talked about, we said, psychology, right? Human behavior and psychology. What's the sentiment of people? So the crazy thing is that with the stock market right now, and I've already talked about this, 13 years stock market has been going sky high. Um, I, again, I can't beat this drum enough that you're seeing a correction. Already we're seeing a correction. Uh, even, I mean, of course, by the time you see this, by the time I'm recording this, there's still been about a 9% drop year to date. I've even seen a client um, coming to us saying, hey, we're wondering what to do. And they have a bunch of money in the market with their financial advisor. They lost just in the last month and a half, right? Almost two months now. They lost well over fifty, sixty thousand dollars in portfolio. That's fifty or sixty thousand. We could have turned it to five or six hundred a month of pass, passive income, but now it's gone just like that because the markets are reacting, right? So what's driving all this? It's ultimately human psychology. You got to see that human behavior is. If there starts to be more fear and panic, which hasn't happened yet, we're still in this semi-euphoric state, right? There's things happening in the market because now they're saying there's no more steam, right? We've run out of steam. There's nothing more. We've already overhyped this market. We've already thrown in tons of money and dumb money's gone into the market where people just throw their money in and the gambling saying, hey, market always goes up. We just throw money in. But now the big money, the institutional money, which are coming from the big banks and financial institutions are pulling their money out slowly while the dumb money was going in. That's why the market was kind of coming up but it wasn't skyrocketing as much over the last year. Now we're starting to see it come down because that might start to pull out and people are starting to wonder, well, what good news is left? We've already tried to factor in for all the best news possible. It can't really get much better than what we've already put into the stock market. And you're starting to see the market decline. And the truth is that the market is so overvalued that it could decline at least another 15, 20% before it hits a bottom. That's possibly like a, a possible bottom. It could go even lower than that. I mean, there's some people that predict that it would have to drop by two thirds, like a 60% drop for the market to get back to normal. Whether it'll do that or not, I don't know. I'm not gonna try to predict anything, but the thing you can look at is where's the human behavior? Right now, more people think the economy is worse off, that, that the future of the economy is actually gonna be worse off, right? This is kind of like what it was in the late seventies before they had to start to have some really big issues, you know, going into the eighties and everything else. People actually believe that, you know, in the late 70s, that the next five years were going to be worse than the previous five years. If you're not sure about that, listen to Jimmy Carter's little speech he gave there. Um, but here's the thing is that we're looking at this. We're seeing that there's human behavior. We're running out of steam. Things are going to get crazy. You, what you need to do is figure out how to protect your money. How do you make sure you don't lose money? That's Warren Buffett's rule number one and two is don't lose money. Protect that money first. 
and then moving to assets that actually can create cash flow. Because the truth is, even with inflation, and we know that inflation's here, right? What's that going to do to drive things up? People say, oh, the real estate market is so overbought. Hey, you haven't seen anything yet. Now, I'm not saying every market in the United States isn't going to, you know, is all going to skyrocket. There's going to be certain markets, I think, like in California, New York, places like that where I've already seen that. Maybe even like Phoenix or, you know, places in Texas, even some, some places in Florida where you might have already seen some big spikes that they might cool off, right? Uh, I'm not saying that they go down, but they might stop rising as much. But um, here's the thing. We still have a shortage of, of properties. We still need that. And even if, especially, especially if we move into a recession, right, which I believe we will, we will move into another recession. I believe is really just part of the COVID recession. I don't really truly believe we kind of came out of it. I think we just had so much money from the government pumping in artificially. It just drove everything up. But now we're moving into, what I believe it is a bigger recession, the recession that probably should have happened. But the, you know, the feds and the government try to postpone it. Again, that crashing plane, just trying to make it coast longer before it actually crashes and burns. And so I think we're moving into that phase right now. So when you start to see that, guys, this is where money, people panic. This is where they start pulling more money out of the market, out of panicking. This is where you might see people pulling money out of Bitcoin even more so than they have, right? You might see people starting to pull out money out of places where they threw it in, trying to keep it, you know, keep it in a place to grow it. And then they're going to need that money. When that happens, oof, you do not want to be in those markets. You do not want to be speculating. You want to be in places where it's more recession resistant. You want to be in places where people need a place to live, right? This is why you're know, looking at, it doesn't mean you just buy a single family home, which could be part of your strategy, but it might be you're investing in apartments. It could be self-storage as people downsize. Do you go into self-storage, right? You know, looking for what people are going into. And by the way, people will say, yeah, but Chris, what if the value of your properties go down for my rentals, right? I'll say, what if it does? If it does, great. You know it because first and foremost, I don't buy expensive properties. I don't buy high-end properties. I buy the properties that people, when things go into recession, people downsize into. And when they downsize in those properties, it usually keeps the value steady or even drives them up. Even better, if people start doing like what did in the last recession and values came down, people or the credit markets got tight, which is another thing you want to watch out for is what are the banks doing? Are they starting to tighten on credit? Once, once there's less money and credit available, things start tanking in the other markets. Well, if that happens, great. Well, that means more people need to rent, driving my rent prices up. The great thing is with inflation, rent goes up with it. I like that. So I get this inflation hedge as well. So anyways, when people ask me, are you scared? No. In fact, I see lots of opportunity. Um, I position myself to be flexible in my plan. You should know, and I'm going to do a separate episode just on this alone, is that every plan should have flexibility. So anyways, guys, Stop watching the Fed. Stop listening to what they say. Stop listening to all the news about the Fed said this or that. Doesn't matter. Watch for yourself. One, what's happening with those treasury yields? And then two, really start to listen to what's the sentiment and psychology of the people. At what point does it start to reverse where it becomes more negative than positive? That's the key I want you to start getting from this. Watch those signals and the feds will just follow suit. You will find yourself ahead of the curve of what the feds say versus behind the curve. That's my advice to you guys this, this week. Go and make it a prosperous week, and we'll see you later. Visit us online at moneyripples.com for more resources to help you fix money leaks and get your money working harder for you now. 